Hey guys, Tyler here. The galactic barrier is an energy field that surrounds the rim of the Milky Way galaxy in Star Trek. Made up of negative energy, it is invisible at a distance to the naked eye and visual recording equipment, but at closer range it shines with a purple-pink glow. No form of transmission is known to be capable of penetrating the barrier, and warp travel through the barrier causes extreme sensory distortions. It has been encountered on several occasions by both Earth and Starfleet vessels, and some ancient civilizations are known to have inhabited regions inside the barrier. But when I say it's made up of negative energy, what exactly does that mean? And while we can be fairly sure that such a structure does not exist in our universe, just how plausible is the galactic barrier from a scientific perspective? Let's find out. Before we dive into the science of the galactic barrier, let's take a look at the history of the phenomenon in the Star Trek timeline. As we learn from the second pilot of the original series, Where No Man Has Gone Before, the barrier was first encountered in the mid to late 21st century by the SS Valiant. The Valiant is said to have been swept into the barrier by a magnetic storm, similar to the one that appeared over the Hawken homeworld in the episode Mirror Mirror. Subsequent events caused the Valiant's destruction and loss of all hands, leaving the barrier's formal discovery to wait another two centuries. Early during James T. Kirk's first five-year mission as captain of the USS Enterprise, a disaster recorder ejected from the Valiant is recovered. The Enterprise crew decodes its message and retraces the Valiant's flight path. At first, the barrier does not register at all on the Enterprise's sensors, but the ship's deflectors do react to it. When entering the galactic barrier, strange electric shocks pass through the ship's shields and affect the nervous systems of various human crew members, killing nine from severe brain damage. Two officers, Dr. Elizabeth Daner and Lieutenant Gary Mitchell, survive the shock and rapidly develop psionic powers. They begin to view their former friends and shipmates as lower life forms, forcing Kirk to kill Mitchell after Daner sacrifices herself. In 2268, the Kelvins from the Andromeda Galaxy enter the Milky Way through the barrier, crippling their generational ships beyond repair. They hijack the Enterprise in an attempt to return home until they too are thwarted by Kirk and his crew. And later that year, the Enterprise becomes stranded in a space-time void deep within the barrier, only to escape as Medusan Ambassador Kolos pilots the ship out. Starfleet has other subsequent encounters with the barrier, such as when the USS Discovery traces the origins of the so-called dark matter anomaly to extragalactic space. But besides these four episodes across the entire franchise, there's virtually no other mention of the barrier in canon. Like numerous other aspects of the original series, by the time of The Next Generation and its spin-offs, the writers tended to stray away from mentioning the astronomical object. And Enterprise, being a prequel, naturally did not depict the barrier either. It's my view that the writers likely made this choice because the galactic barrier is kind of stupid, isn't it? Or am I the only one who's always thought that the concept of an energy barrier surrounding the galaxy, at least the way that it's portrayed in TOS, is kind of goofy? Indeed, I'm certainly not alone in not only highlighting the absurdity of the barrier, but also pointing out how the concept of espers, humans with psionic powers, is never mentioned again in Star Trek. Okay, I've spent enough time mocking this topic. Let's actually break down what's really going on here. The galactic barrier's composition has always been somewhat controversial, and in fact, even contradictory between on-screen encounters. Where No Man Has Gone Before strongly insinuates that the galactic barrier has no detectable radiation, energy, or density. This in and of itself is not really a totally outlandish analysis. As a matter of fact, multiple sci-fi stories invoke the phenomenon of an object emitting no waste energy, be it in the form of heat or other radiation. The heptapods concave ships in the 
film Arrival are described in this way, for example. But the episode, by any other name, clearly states that the barrier is in fact made up of negative energy, not negative in energy. What? This is evident from a plan devised by Scotty and Spock to flood the Enterprise's warp nacelles with positive energy after the ship is hijacked by the Kelvins. This positive energy would naturally collide with the negative energy of the galactic barrier and destroy the ship, similar to the kind of reaction that happens when matter and antimatter collide. As far as its shape, the non-canon reference book Star Trek Star Charts depicts the barrier as a toroidal object that that surrounds the entire galactic disk. It isn't situated at the rim as stated on screen, but is merely thickest at the rim, starting out at a distance of about 40,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. This frankly makes more sense as what's presented in the original series, as TOS often depicted the Enterprise being capable of traveling much further distances in a shorter amount of time than later installments insinuate 23rd century ships should have been capable of. And while visual evidence in the episodes would contradict this notion, Star Charts asserts that the Valiant, the Enterprise, and the Kelvins all enter and exit the galaxy not at the galactic rim, but closer to Federation space. Of course, Star Charts, as useful of a tool as it is, is full of multiple mistakes and contradictions. For instance, the distance to the galactic center is 26,000 light years, not 40,000. Ultimately, I think it's best to consider the general thematic implications of each episode rather than get so hung up on the details, as important as those details can be. Indeed, while Discovery makes a frankly bold move in bringing back the barrier, many sources indicate that by the 24th century it's become less of a problem than it was in the past, thanks mostly to advances in shield technology, allowing ships to bypass the effects of the barrier's negative energy. Of course, Discovery is a 23rd century ship in the 32nd century, but you, you get my point. Before we go any further, I do want to mention that according to my analytics, over 75%, that's three quarters of the people who watch these videos are not subscribed. That has got to change. If you're enjoying this video and you want to see more like it, click that subscribe button so you won't miss future uploads. Now, back to the video. Okay, this is all good and well, but again, what is negative energy. Well, it's actually a real concept in physics used to explain certain aspects of general relativity and quantum mechanics. I've discussed before on this channel things like virtual particles and the Casimir effect. So here's a bit of an overview. In quantum field theory, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle states that the position and momentum of a subatomic particle cannot be accurately measured simultaneously. The uncertainty principle allows for the existence of so-called virtual particles, which pop in and out of existence very quickly. These virtual particles are fundamental to the Casimir effect, in which two metal plates placed nanometers apart in a vacuum appear to be pushed together seemingly out of nowhere. This happens because virtual particles with wavelengths larger than the separation of the two plates creates an external pressure, more accurately described as a negative energy density. The vacuum energy caused by the virtual particles is greater than the vacuum energy between the two plates, which is too small to negate the effect due to the restriction of wavelengths in this space. Negative energy in virtual particles also form part of the basis of Hawking radiation. When a pair of virtual particles with negative energy appears near the event horizon of a black hole, the point of no return, one might get drawn in. This negative energy particle reduces the black hole's net energy while the other becomes a positive particle and escapes. Thus, the black hole slowly evaporates. A similar process is also thought to be how the intense radiation of quasars is generated. But most exciting, in my opinion, is the role that negative energy plays in the speculative science of wormholes. Most models predict that negative energy is required to keep the wormholes' mouths open. 
Some physicists like Stephen Hawking and Kip Thorne have argued that stable artificial wormholes could be created by concentrating large amounts of negative mass at certain points in space-time to change its energy density. This process may have even occurred naturally shortly after the Big Bang if negative mass cosmic strings were inflated to macroscopic size by cosmic inflation. So our best models of the universe predict that wormholes could be out there. Until we see one, we won't know, but black holes were predicted by math before we observed one, and they're real, so, you know, it's, it's something to think about. Negative mass being a sort of exotic matter would normally violate various energy conditions of general relativity, but many real quantum effects like the Casimir effect already do that, so the possibility still remains that, once again, exotic structures like wormholes could exist. And exotic matter is a term used to describe a variety of phenomena, including dark matter and other states of matter that are not commonly encountered but are feasible to create in laboratory settings. That does not include dark matter, those are, those are two separate things. So whoever created the galactic barrier could have done so by manipulating the energy state of various points in space-time with negative mass, which is a fundamental element of real-world theoretical physics. But who did create the galactic barrier? Well, we don't really know for sure. Greg Cox's Q Continuum novels state that the galactic barrier was created half a million years ago by the Q to protect the Milky Way from another being called Zero, who was banished for his destruction of the Takan Empire. The novel Captain's Glory theorizes that the barrier was created four billion years ago by the first humanoids to protect the Milky Way from a malevolent dark matter entity called the Totality. And a library computer entry in the game Star Trek Starfleet Academy speculates that the barrier was created by some other ancient race to keep things like the planet killer from the episode The Doomsday Machine outside of the galaxy. Though that same entry also states that if this is true, then the barrier wasn't very effective. All I can say is that, assuming that it is artificial in nature, which it probably is in Star Trek, it was likely built by someone to keep something away from us. The Galactic Barrier is certainly one of the wackier parts of the original series. It's a frankly bizarre sci-fi concept rivaled in its absurdity only by, well, frankly everything in Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. What does God need with a starship? But the assertion in various episodes that the barrier is composed of negative energy invokes aspects of real-world theoretical physics. The same physics that could provide the basis for things like warp drive and time travel. Also, the galactic barrier is connected to other elements of the Star Trek universe that have since been relegated to storytelling dead ends, like the existence of humans with psionic powers. Of course, this can be reconciled with the understanding that humans are not naturally psionic, but that such abilities are the result of contact with the barrier itself, mainly affecting people with high esper ratings. This is basically stated in Where No Man Has Gone Before and is expounded upon in various novels. All in all, I thought that the Galactic Barrier was an interesting concept that would make for an entertaining video. So what are your thoughts on the Galactic Barrier? Do you think it was a good storytelling device? Have I been way too harsh on it? Or are you glad that it's been largely forgotten in subsequent installments? Let me know down below. With that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper.